So the first term, what is enforcement? Again, uh, most of these ideas are not mine. They're taken from other more authoritative sources, which I will cite in the paper that I'm sure I will be asked to write after this. Um, so when we talk about enforcement, we are talking about a set of procedures to be employed when a party is found not to be in compliance with its treaty obligations. So first step back. I think yesterday it came out in the group exercise and it's come up again in presentations now, um, especially for the non-lawyers. No, it's, we have treaty obligations. That's what you call the hard law obligations, right? And then you have other goals, aspirations that you may not find in a treaty, but you may find in um, internationally agreed uh, instruments, for instance, the 2030 Agenda. You know? So you, that's soft law. At the same time, within a treaty, you can also have obligations, but that because of the wording are not binding. That's why maybe sometimes you've seen in the press, oh, these, these, negoci these negotiators are fighting about the shalls and the shoulds and the commas. And, the, and that's very important because in, in treaty law, whether it's a shall or it should makes a difference on whether it is actually an obligation or not, no? So the premise when you're talking about enforcement is that you're talking about treaty obligations. So the first thing is that the obligation has to be found in a treaty, so in a legally binding instrument. It's not some political declaration, but it's an actual treaty. It's entered into force, and your country has actually ratified it and is considered a party. And within that treaty, that the language used is mandatory. So it's not... It's None of these uh, parties shall uh, parties should parties will endeavor to. We're talking about the shalls here, right? With the with the slight qualification, and I think uh, Professor Fitzmorris talked about it yesterday. That there is the phenomenon that, especially in the climate change regime, some of the obligations that are referred to under the compliance mechanism actually relate to obligations with the double quotes that are found in implementing decisions of the decision-making body of the Kyoto Protocol. So, but we start from the premise that what we're talking about are mandatory obligations. And we are in a situation where a party is found not to be in compliance with those treaty obligations. So that's when enforcement kicks in. So the next question is, what is compliance? But before we get to compliance, we first talk about implementation, and then we will relate implementation to compliance. Okay. So what is implementation? Again, this is a definition that you will find in, in some of the UNEP, uh, UN environment materials. So it's the set of actions that a party to a multilateral environmental agreement takes to achieve compliance with its treaty obligations. So maybe let's take, uh, just to bring this closer, can someone give an example of an MEA that we've talked about yesterday or today and give an example of what would be the kind of action that would be considered implementation? Anybody? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, even for Triple C, the Climate Change Convention, and at the national level, uh, uh, would be, for instance, creating a national MRV system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, if you have, if you create your system for measurement, reporting, and verification, yeah. So the the legislation around that, the institutions around that, so that would constitute implementation. Any other example you can think of? Yes, I do. Okay, good. Yeah, so we had another one. Mm -hmm. Yes, all right. So those are the kinds of actions we, we refer to when we use the term implementation. Okay. Now what's compliance? Compliance is the fulfillment by the contracting parties of their obligations under an MEA or any amendments to that MEA, okay? So there's implementation, there's what you do uh, in accordance with your commitment, and compliance is the actual fulfillment of that commitment. So the question then is, what is the relationship between implementation and compliance? So, <clears throat> first rule, implementation is not equivalent to compliance. 
So why would that be? Have you ever been in a situation where you've tried but you've not succeeded? Many times, right? And then you say in the end, well, at least I tried, right? So you may be implementing, you may be taking actions, but your actions may not actually be meeting the standards, right? So implementation is not equivalent to compliance, see? Because the implementing actions may be insufficient to meet your treaty obligations. And of course, in the theory of compliance, you ask the question of the why. I think someone yesterday was talking about, it could be a natural catastrophe. No, you may be trying, for instance, to lower your emissions through a very strong policies to control solid waste management, for example, and then suddenly there's a forest fire and whatever emissions you reduced are canceled out by the emissions from the forest fire. Or, Maybe just as you had an economic downturn or whatever. There are various reasons. But the main point is that implementation is not equivalent to compliance. And neither is compliance equivalent to implementation. So you'd think that compliance is the higher bar, right? That if a, par if a party is found to be in compliance or conversely, if a party is not found to be in non-compliance, that you would think it would be equivalent to implementation. But it may not be. Any ideas why that could happen? I think we had some ideas yesterday when you were talking about overachievement. Yeah, when, when the bar is too low or when you would say the agreement is not ambitious enough. Maybe the goal set didn't require you to do much, right? Any other ideas? One is also, there are several obligations in an agreement and maybe that obligation doesn't apply to you. For instance, in the Montreal Protocol, you have a phase-out schedule for consumption and production. But if you're not a producing country, then, you know, it's easy to, to not be in non-compliance because you don't produce and therefore you don't have to phase out your production, right? So those are two particular uh, possible reasons. And the other one, which also relates to the lack of ambition, is if the party took sufficient action prior to becoming a party. And maybe the party got lucky, or maybe, let's say, especially in agreements where you have a phasing of action, it could be that the institutional measures you took or the actions taken by industry, which wants to become a leader in this technology, were such that uh, so much achievement was done even before the obligation became legally effective. No? So those are some examples. So just to illustrate the relationship between the two.